Guten Morgen, guten Morgen, Grüezi, Salamat Pagi, Nidhau, uh, Ohio Gozamas, Merhaba, Bonjourno, Buenos Dias. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's exciting to uh, come to Hamburg and see this initiative that's happening in Hamburg. Uh, the Smart Port is obviously a uh, continuation of the whole discussion about how we're going to change our lives to use smart technologies. And it's really interesting to see how that started. You know, I used to be a musician and a record producer. Uh, I'm afraid to say I didn't study business or technology, but I studied theology and music. And when I was a musician and a producer, I worked in the music business. In 1999, some of you may remember Napster. Do you remember Napster, the free downloading tool, right? So that was 1999, I was in San Francisco back then, and the record company said this is really bad because it changes our business model away from distribution. We cannot control distribution if we have free downloads, right? Turns out, today, all of the legal services in the world, Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, do exactly the same thing, right? Music is in the cloud. So it's very important to be able to look forward into the future. And this is what I want to do for you today. So, my key topic is about digital transformation. Uh, and it's very interesting, when you look around you, most of you probably have kids, right? When you look at your kids, there's a great uh, saying in China that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. Right? Because children don't have an obsession with making money yet, right? or having to make money. They can just look at what is, and they can predict the future. Most of my work is not, however, to predict the future. Most of my work is to observe and then go forward five years from today and work on things that will help people reinvent. And I do this in many different industries. Many of you may not know what actually a futurist is. So I, I gave you an interesting uh, uh, sort of a symbol of what I do. So I do a lot of listening. And I think this is very important for you guys also in your business because your business is a very long-term business. You have to plan 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead, like the satellite companies that put satellites into space. So it's very important to listen to what goes on and to develop imagination. I mean, who would have thought, think about this for a second, right? Who would have thought that you are here today, you can use an app called Say Hi or Google Translate to instantly translate a conversation in 34 languages? If you haven't tried it, you should try Google Translate or Say Hi, it costs $2. But Say Hi allows you to have a conversation. I was in Tokyo a couple of months ago. I had a half hour conversation with the sushi chef. He spoke Japanese, I spoke German into the app. Huh? And it worked. It was not like Google Translate, but it actually worked, right? So science fiction, you know, you guys are probably familiar with some science fiction movies, was actually a lot of science fiction is becoming true today. So and think about all the things that we're looking at, for example, automated processes and uh, unmanned vehicles. You know, there are people saying that most airlines would be happy to not have a pilot. Right? Oh, they don't have to pay them and there would be no unions, right? I guess, uh, I guess that it's a good or a bad, you know, the robot would not join the union, I suppose. <laughs> but in any case, because it's allegedly actually safer, right? but how would you feel about flying in an airplane that is a robot? Right? I'm not so sure about that, right? whether that works or not. So technology and transformation is really important. Uh, my company is based in Basel in Switzerland. Um, I spent 17 years in America, but I'm from Germany originally, so if I speak too quickly and say too many things, that's the American speaking in me. So we do this for about 150 companies around the world. We help them to develop future scenarios and to observe the future. This is the most important slide of today. This is a slide depicting the fact that we live in an exponential world. Moore's law, you're familiar with, Metcalfe's law and other laws like this. The development of technology is absolutely mind-boggling, right? When you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right, that's actually a very linear progression. When you count one, two, four, eight, sixteen, like you do here, the changes are absolutely fundamental. And we're now at the take-off point of the curve. Remember all the stuff we talked about 10 years ago, the paperless office, right? Didn't happen. Now it's happening. Huh? 20 years ago, the flying car, right? electric car, 
Flying, no, but electric car, right? Shared car is happening. I and mean, all the things we're, we're talking about takeoffs every, every week, there's a major accomplishment. A colleague of mine said the other day, this, this year will be the first year that one of the big oil companies will get out of the oil business to go into sustainable business. We're talking about exponential changes, I mean, mind boggling changes that we're seeing. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in the previous 300 since the Industrial Revolution. And some of that is actually pretty scary. And when you think about that, how machines are taking over our lives, right? You know, when you do research and you talk to people, uh, Facebook users, for example, between, say, 15 and 30, and kids, if you ask them who is your favorite person in the world, what is your best friend, you know what they say? My mobile phone. I mean, the changes that we see happening here. Uh, some of you, again, going back to your kids, if you give your kids a CD or a DVD for Christmas, they will call a therapist. Right? Right? They'll say, what is wrong with you? Where have you been? Nobody has these stupid plastic things. Any, still, anybody still buy CDs here? Sorry about that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's... Anyway, I mean, now you, now you can use a mobile phone, you can, have, you can use an, an app to get divorced, just in case you're in need. Uh, there's 35 apps to get divorced on the mobile. Huh? I mean, it's too late for me, it's already passed behind me, but... So, what happens here is that humanity changes so quickly because of technology, and that this has great impact on shipping and ports, of course, as we've been discussing. On every facet of your business, some of it's scary, other ones not so scary. But with technology, the question used to be years ago that we would say, "Okay, um, you know, we we have to see if technology can actually do this, right? if it's possible." That was always the top question. For example, can we connect to the cloud? Can we find a way to connect the ship to the internet in the middle of the ocean? And now the answer is just simply yes. Right? Whatever you want to ask, the answer is yes. Can we put nanobots in your bloodstream to fix your cholesterol? The answer is, can be done. There are some side effects, probably. Can we eventually cure cancer by changing the genes? The answer is, probably yes. So now the question of technology has become different, right? Take this thing called Uber. Anybody here know Uber? It's a great taxi service that is a peer-to-peer, -peer, like sharing rides and stuff using internet and mobile. Right? Here's an interesting fact. The Columbia University study said that if you had a, a fleet of 9,000 autonomous cars in New York, you could get rid of all the taxis. 9,000 autonomous cars correlated through the cloud and mobile devices would cover all of the traffic with an average person wait, waiting 36 seconds and the fares being 50 cents per mile. That's what technology does. Now imagine if you're a taxi driver, you don't like this, right? I mean, if you're a record company, you don't like the internet until now, maybe, right? Uh, and clearly, you know, if you are a company that has 100,000 employees, if you can fire 30,000 employees because of automation, you like that, right? But the employees don't like that. So there are many changes coming towards us, you know, because technology is, is like this. And you know, the stuff, for example, if you go to Japan, many Japanese people have an ele electronic dog. Right? That sounds funny, but it's true. And they're using robots to lift elderly out of the bed into the bathtub. So now we have robotic cars, ships, planes, pets, and friends. I mean, the Jibo, which is here, right? Look, at, check it out on YouTube. The Jibo is by the words of the CEO, the world's first family robot, right? who talks to you as if he was a family member. Oh, of course, this is America, you know, but still. Right? Makes you wonder what else it will do eventually. Yeah. But anyway, digital transformation of ports and shipping is imminent, and it, well, it's here, right? But all the stuff that we're going to see, I mean, mind-boggling, big data. So far, that was just big bull, right? It was just big talk. Right? It was, but now it's actually getting real. We can use that data. We can make it intelligent, right? Using artificial intelligence. Just in case you don't know what artificial intelligence is, it's basically machine intelligence emulating human capacities. 
And if you use a mobile phone, you have artificial intelligence inside the mobile phone. Right? And that's basically what's happening. Artificial intelligence, robotics, unmanned ships, sustainability becoming the focus. So this is a very big deal. Right? This basically what's happening here is with this uh, transformation, we can say, what if we take a look at 2030, what can we safely say that's going to happen? First thing, everybody is connected. Right? There's a scary thought. Today is 2.7 billion people on the internet. By 2030, it will be roughly about 75, 80% of the total population of roughly 9 billion. So 7 to 8 billion people connected to the internet. India, Africa, Southeast Asia, all over the world, of course, all of the territories that are currently underserved. Right? You know what that's going to do? Right? A huge amount of change, of innovation, of consumption, of what people do, what they find out. Imagine all the stuff that we can do. Online education, you can get a degree on the internet today, but imagine in 10 years, uh, it's open to anyone, at any budget. That's a huge shift. Robots and artificial intelligence everywhere. This is Baxter. Baxter is a $20,000 robot that has a back order of one million back orders, right? One million people want to buy this thing for their factories. I mean, if you're in China, they're buying Baxters by the, the thousands, right? It's the first robot that you can actually train. Uh, nanotechnology and, of course, 3D printing. You think this is a joke, right? 3D printed food? It's not. Right? It's just as bad of a joke as downloading music over the internet. <laughs> it becomes completely normal. I tasted the other day some 3D printed meat. Right? I'm not much of a meat fan, but I could hardly tell the difference. But if you know that it's printed, of course you wouldn't enjoy it. Right? But I mean, these things are happening now on a mind-boggling scale. And Ray Kurzweil, who is probably the world's most well-known futurist, who was really a brilliant guy, he wrote a book about what he calls the singularity. And I urge you with great caution to read this book, but basically the singularity says, in 2027, there is a time where computers will match the capacity of the human brain. You know, right now we're at 1.0.6, under 0.16 percent of the human brain with the biggest computer in the world right? in, in terms of processing. Never mind emotions, of course, right? which do exist, by the way. But this singularity moment is basically saying at that point, machines can handle lots of human tasks. And that can be good or can be bad. I mean, if you're obviously running ports, machines handling things in a really good way is a huge deal, right? It's, I mean, that changes the whole equation. But I want to remind you of one thing before we go on from this, right? This cartoon says it all. We weren't downloaded. We were born. Right. And, I, and I think for the foreseeable future, that's still going to be the case. Maybe some people will, Google will eventually offer downloading of babies, I suppose. Uh, now, what that means for me is, Yes, we're going to have automation, digitization, virtualization, robotization, and other agents uh, pretty much everywhere. But the key thing is business will always be human, right? I mean, we'd, let's not forget that. This is a very, very important part of why people do business, right? despite all the technology that we're talking about. So what the key question is for 2030 that I have for you and your companies. I use um, um, Gary Hamill for this who said the, uh, bing the single biggest reason that companies fail is that they overinvest in what is as opposed to what might be. And we can say this is our problem in Europe, right? Maybe not in Hamburg. <laughs> but I live in Switzerland where we never invest in what might be because we don't want to take a risk. And in America, where I spent 17 years, it's the reverse. You never invest in what is, you always invest in what might be because you're looking beyond the obvious. So that's very important. Let's take a look at what might be in your future. I think this is becoming crucial for us. As I said earlier, supercomputers today are not a match for, for human brains yet. But this is what happens when you think about this story that Hemingway says, how does a man go broke gradually, then suddenly? And this is how technology is changing, right? Very gradually and then suddenly. Here's a great illustration from Mother Jones talking about how long does it take for computers to have the same brain power, uh, power as the human brain, right? 
not much happens for a long time, but in the last 14 years, boom, it's there. Right? Here's a snippet of this. If you don't think that technology will change every aspect of your life in the next 10 years, right, you just haven't observed what we're seeing today. This is really something that we have, on a personal level and a business level, have to get ready for. And some of what we need, of course, also a critical viewpoint. Not all of technology is good just because it exists. Right? There's other thing to think about. So here, it's a very important book that a friend of mine wrote called The Exponential Organization. I urge you all to buy it. If you're in this business, you've got to read this book because your business is vastly exponential. And here's a graph showing the difference between exponential and linear. Right? I mean, exponential goes up like this and linear continues. People are not going to be exponential. Your kids aren't going to be exponential because they have a mobile phone. Right? Or we don't think faster because we Twitter. We don't have more friends, real friends, because of Facebook. We cannot be exponential. But we have to think about what that means. And this is the sweet spot, right? The disruption. And I can tell you right now, I looked at this the last couple of weeks, your business is about to be disrupted by a lot of very, very serious startup funded players. I looked at this uh, uh, VC funding website the other day. There's about 850 companies who are funded to bring technology to shipping the maritime business. And yes, of course, there's a lot of things are pretty hard to disrupt, right? Because they're complex. Right? But that's only a temporary protection. So disruption is coming there. How will this impact ports in the future? These five trends I've taken from a recent report from McKinsey and, and Tata about uh, disruptive technology. Automation of knowledge work, robotics, autonomous vehicles. Sounds kind of like geek territory, right? Like you have to be a, a geek to, to appreciate this. <laughs> But I tell you, in a couple of years, this is just about as geeky as sending an SMS. It's something we have to get used to. We have to take a look at these trends and say, you know, McKinsey says the economic impact on the high level is $30 trillion a year of this kind of digital transformation. And of course, you know, yeah, because you're traveling the world all the time, just like me, the most important thing is how do we connect right? and how do we do things uh, while we're traveling. And, and you can safely say that connectivity is the new oxygen. By the way, I will make this available later on for downloading on my website. Uh, it's a futuristgerd.com, so the name is G-E-R-D, like gastrointestinal reflux disease, same thing, but as a name, so futuristgerd.com. So, uh, you can download the PDF there later. So connectivity is now the new oxygen, and in many ways, people say connectivity is now the new opium. Right? It's like we're so used to it that when we don't have it, we feel withdrawal. Right? And the Internet of Things will really make that worse or better, as it depends how you look at it, and wearable computing. Right? Being, being able to compute without wearing, having to hold the device. Uh, Microsoft has a great project called the HoloLens which you may have seen, which allows you to put a visor on, like, like Google Glass, but better, right? and see the data around you. Imagine if you had that in a port. It's like having a supercharged human being with all the information on top and videos and overlays and data feeds and, you know, that kind of thing is coming. Right? So this is point number one. If you're in a ports business, connectivity, right? Ultra high connectivity. That, that feeds everything. And, of course, on the ship as well. The other two points are this. Everywhere around us, we see automation. It's really quite simple. Anything that can be automated will be automated. Uh, that's kind of a Darwinistic statement, of obviously. Right? If you're a bookkeeper, financial analyst, checkout clerk, uh, file manager, computers can do that work. I mean, look around you. In Germany, I visited a few places the other day to see that in many restaurants, the iPad has replaced the waitress. I went to a sushi place in Freiburg the other day, and you don't have a waitress anymore. You, you order with the iPad on the table, and they just bring the food. Right? I mean, you can't flirt with the iPad, but it, it, you know, I, I suppose it's a, uh, a cost-saving measure. Right? But automation is everywhere. And the other thing is that so far, a lot of computer systems and so-called big data was pretty big stupid, right? Didn't really have a lot of intelligence. 
And now cognitive computing, so-called cognitive, you know, computers that can think, and parentheses, right? Intelligence goes everywhere. So this is the other thing you should invest in. It's not just data, but intelligence. And this is why we have, of course, companies like Siemens and Philips and, 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 uh, and uh, IBM and, and, and many others here, right, looking at these topics of intelligence in that system. So if you want to get scared, you, you uh, think about this tonight before you go into bed. Everything becomes connected, intelligent, observed, efficient, and optimized. I put a little star there, right? Because the star says, of course, not everything will, right? But the thing is, of course, when everything becomes intelligent, everything is observed. So that, that also creates a problem, right? Because we don't want to be observed, but we would like to observe others so we can learn from the data. And think about that for a second, right? Google's main mission in life is not to index the web. Right? It's to index us. Right? They make money by indexing us. So in the shipping business, this means that everything that happens can be connected, observed, optimized. Right? And this is all going to happen in the next five to ten years. Again, some of that is a critical issue when it's about jobs, right? You will have less people in the end working. There's no doubt about that, right? But you will need many other people working other jobs. Data scientists, privacy managers, you know, people who do new jobs that don't even exist yet. Here's a good colleague of mine, Jeremy Rifkin, which I urge you to read his, read his books. He says, the Internet of Things means we have to turn infrastructure from dumb into smart. Does that ring a bell for you? Turn infrastructure from dumb into smart. And you know, the funny part is I looked at some of your profiles before I got here. We also have to turn ourselves into from disconnected to connected. It's very little activity on social networks or Twitter. It's very interesting that it's kind of like a separate world, right? It's not just the infrastructure, but also us, right? We have to get connected. We have to get into those things that are happening outside. Right? Turning infrastructure from dumb into smart. The Internet of Things will be an $8.9 trillion market, according to this research, I think it's from IBM, or from Cisco, actually, 227 billion connected things. Did you know there was research the other day saying that if Unilever and Procter & Gamble combined their logistics and used the Internet of Things, they could save 50% of global logistic costs? Right? I mean, talking about a profit here, right? I mean, Yes, it would not be easy to do with competitive forces, obviously. <laughs> right. But the Internet of Things, mind-boggling what we're going to see there. Pretty much everything that can be automated or digitized will be. You're seeing here on the left, of course, a thermostat that is digitized. The, the luggage ch check-in, where you just kick your suitcase into a hole, just goes away, right? Like in Amsterdam. Call centers. Do you know how many people work in call centers? 110 million. You know how many people will be left in, in 10 years? Two or three percent of those. Because software can, re can replace most of that activity. That's bad for the people working, but I think there'll be other options for them to find other jobs, I hope. But this automation is happening, right? And the most important thing is, in the process of efficiency, we should not delete humanity. Because okay? humanity is how we do business. There is no reason to do business if the whole thing is a giant machine. Right? It's a machine buying from a machine. That would not be much fun. Right? So we should not delete humanity in the process of efficiency. This is also very important when we think about labor. We should keep people working because it's human, even if we can replace them. And those that are replacing people to work with machines, maybe they should pay a tax for others not to work. Right? Those things are all going to be discussed in the next few years. But everything around us, you know, looking at this whole uh, segment of maritime and ports, you know, will be e-everything, automated, right? Smart, connected from the customs to logistics and, of course, to connectivity on the ship itself. I mean, that's quite clear, obviously. Uh, and this graph also shows what's happening is that basically everything around us is moving into the cloud. So let me ask a question here. Who in this audience streams music through the mobile phone? Who is streaming music like Spotify, Deezer, Zimfy? Anybody? Astro, YouTube, or I mean, yeah, I mean, it's basically music in the cloud. 
books, right? All of you guys are reading e-books. I'm pretty certain of that, right? Especially when you're a little bit older, it's great because of the, the screen. You can zoom and you can switch on the light, right? You know, Amazon sells three times as many uh, e-books than printed books. It's a mind-boggling fact what's happening there. So everything is moving into the cloud. Our music, our films, our television shows, Hulu, Netflix, our books, our financial data. I mean, the banks are, of course, scared about this, right? Imagine if our money moves into the cloud. Cars move into the cloud. Ships move into the cloud, so to speak, in terms of connectivity. Very important point, right? Send some networks for everything. I mean, if you look at what's happening here in terms of cost, this graph shows computing cost performance, right, going towards zero, essentially computing becoming almost free. And then this, course, this chart here shows how cheap it is to do a startup. Your competition isn't going to be the other guys in this room, the other ports, the other organizations. It's people coming from the outside, from a lateral point of view, and reinventing what you do by getting into the back door. Just take a look at my most favorite example, Airbnb. As many bad things as you can say about Airbnb. <laughs> Do you guys know what Airbnb is? Essentially, swapping of rooms, like eBay for rooms. Right? You don't go to the hotel. You go directly through the website, airbnb.com. And you go there to find a hotel room or a suite or a private room, whatever you want to, whatever is available. In Hamburg alone, I checked yesterday, 17,000 places for rent for a day, a week, and the rates are usually a half or a third or even less. So Airbnb was possible because the startup cost is zero. Airbnb doesn't own any places. They don't own hotels. They don't pay taxes yet. Right? It's just a database. <laughs> right? I mean, that kind of disruption is going to happen in your markets as well. Here's the other important slide is that this future is not just exponential. If that was the, the case, that would be hard enough because it's hard for us to think exponential. I mean, have you, thought, have you done an exercise, gone home and said, I know what's going to happen by 2020 and by 2030, right? You need to do that right? because it requires foresight. Now, this, this chart shows that it's not just exponential. It's also combinatorial, which means all the stuff that's happening at the same time. Artificial intelligence, connected healthcare, autonomous vehicles, the energy internet. Again, you can download those slides later because there's, there's quite a few here. Just to, set, to show you one example of what happens here in combinatorial, rather confusing slide, I would say. But it shows you everything is interconnected. So here's your surprise. You're no longer in the port business. You and the business surrounding all the businesses of what a port does. Technology, social, vehicles, the sharing economy, logistics, renewable energy, the Internet of Things. You and all those businesses. And your competitors will come from those businesses, not from other ports. So if you can take that home as one of the things, don't compete with each other, hyper-collaborate. Right? This is a very, very important point. This is our future. Right? It's complex, it's moving, it's interdependent. In other words, your business model depends on many other moving parts. And the mission is to build an ecosystem. A function, that's why you're here, right? Is to build an ecosystem of how this future goes forward. Because basically what we see with this example here is the US Post Service and UPS, two years ago, they were both almost dead and they teamed up to create a new logistics structure based on technology in the US, and they're thriving. So interdependence, hyper-collaboration. Many of us live in these kind of situations, at right? silos. So we think of our business as being X, Y, Z, as technology, or as contracts, or as legal, or whatever it is, right? And now what's happening is that if you're looking at the most successful businesses in the last 10 years, they're not in silos. They live outside of the silos. They go across the silos. Great example is Tesla. Right? The, the uh, electric car, pretty soon self-driving car. If, uh, if you've seen a Tesla before, and I've, I've test-driven a few, I wanted to get one, but it's too expensive. But in Switzerland, we don't really have the electric hookup yet, really. 
But in any case, you know, Tesla is not in the car business, right? What business is Tesla in? Right? Data, energy, mobility. Right? Tesla is not a car company. So take the example from Tesla and say, I'm not a port company. Right? I have other things around the port that I can do. And that's what, what you're here to discuss, right? That's what the smart port is. That's not about saying we're going to optimize how we load and unload, right? Uh, okay. What is around that? Uh, what surrounds us? The, the idea of essentially being in silos is game over. If you want to live in a silo, be my guest. Uh, chances are you won't exist in 15 years. And that's really true for a lot of companies. Uh, we have to think outside and think lateral. Let me address one important topic. Children's toys. No, just kidding. The unicorn. Anybody know what a unicorn is? This is the word number one in Silicon Valley now. It have, it, it's about companies that have raised a billion dollars from private investors in less than two years. And there's a word for that now. Right? It's called a unicorn, right? It's a magic. Right? Of course, that really only works in America. But <laughs> The unicorn thing is really interesting, right? Because now you have over 110 companies that are worth a billion dollars raised from private money. Right? And you know what industries are looking at? B2B, banking, financial, insurance, government, education, mining, shipping, pharma. Media is already over. Media is already done. Right? So this is very interesting what happens here, right? If you're looking at this, then I also want to introduce you to a couple black swans. You know, a black swan is essentially something that happens as a fluke, something that, that comes up and just hits you. You don't know where it came from, like Napster. Because now we're at the dawn of four new economies. This is also very important to recognize and will cause you some thinking. Right? The first one is the maker economy. You know it's now possible to print your mobile phone cover, to print your shoes, to print a 3D object, to print an engine part that goes into the airplane engine. It is now possible to print very complex things. In the next five to 10 years, we'll be able to print just about anything really complex, including houses, right? China has a machine that prints houses. I saw it on YouTube the other day, it's mind blocking. What will happen if people need to ship less because they're printing? Do you believe that? You don't want to believe that, but you know. I don't know. It's a difficult question. Huh? The sharing economy. Americans, for the first time in 20 years, are buying less houses, and the so-called millennials, you know, the kids that are around 30, they have less interest in owning a house or getting a driver's license or buying a car. They share it. It's called the sharing economy. I mean, if you're 50 like me, you're saying, what the hell is it? I'm not, not going to share my car. This is a stupid idea, especially if you live in Germany. Right? And you would never do that. The car is holy. Right? I worship the car. Uh, but now we have a kind of a disownership. Right? People are talking about this a lot. And we have the circular economy, which is really gaining ground. This idea of a new logic, a, a, a capitalist logic called people, planet, profit. Right? It's three things that matter in life, not just profit. <laughs> well, that's always been true, but now we're actually getting into it, and this is part of the reason of the whole debate, sustainable capitalism. And then we have the experience economy. Think about this for a second. The last time you went on a really great trip into nature with your family somewhere, you think about that trip for the next 25 years. The last time you bought an iPhone, you think about your iPhone for a week. Then you get something else. Right? Buying product is not satisfactory for a lot of people anymore. They want experiences. That's another reason why we're going to look at how commercial things are changing right? and what that means for shipping. So in many ways, we're going from products and ownership to service and access. Right? So the examples here are, we used to buy a map to go to cities. Now we have an app. Airbnb is replacing the hotel. Spotify is replacing the record. Netflix replacing the TV and the DVD and so on. What does that mean for your business? Will people buy less products? I think eventually that's probably going to happen. 
The next five to 10 years, I kind of doubt it because of this. Five billion people in the middle class in the next 10 years. There is no place more interesting to observe this than Brazil. Anybody here from Brazil? Yeah, let me see Brazilians here. Bom dia, wake up. Okay. <laughs> Five billion people in the middle class. In Brazil, the middle class has doubled in 10 years. And consumption is a big thing, of course, for them. All right, so here's one other important point. I do a lot of work in the, in the music and media business. This is a chart depicting what's happening with the movie business. Okay. 75% of the movie companies, the big Hollywood studios, Universal and Sony and others, 75% of what they sold was DVDs and theater tickets. Okay. And some of you paid, depending on where you live, between $10 and $40 for a DVD that would only work in your region. Thank with their wisdom. But now, right, people want to buy things digitally and stream them on demand. And guess what the difference is? When you give your content to Netflix or Hulu or YouTube, right, what do you get? $10 a month for 500, or I think it's actually a million movies, right? $10 for a million movies. So all of a sudden, the margin has gone from $25 for a DVD to 0 0.0.0. .0 .0 .0 point, you know, per stream. Okay. And what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, we're we not going to do that? Okay. That's what digital stuff does. Right? That's what efficiency does. And that is going to be part of your future as well, that kind of change, right? The change for the billion dollar startup club, here's a couple of things. Also interesting to observe that many of those unicorns are in the US and in China. And, I mean, that is an interesting fact. Right? Where is India and Brazil? And never mind Germany, of course, for that matter. So here's a question for you. Which pieces of your business, whether you're in ports or shipping or maritime, are digitally contestable? Which means somebody can invent some software to put a dent into your business. That happened in the movie business, the music business, the books business. The airport business, right? I mean, people that are now inventing virtual travel, like telepresence and holograms, that is going to cut into airline travel. Not now, but when it's good. So which part is contestable? Very good question. And then IBM comes up with a, this whole idea of cognitive computing, computers that can think along like a person. And here's a question for you. Do you think we're going to have sentient, you know, thinking ports? in 10 years. Ports that can actually think like the person that thinks now that runs it. That is a crazy idea, right? I mean, I can see you laughing and saying, oh my God, he's really smoking something. Sentient ports, right? I mean, this follows computing in general, of course. IBM has a chip. It's called the cognitive chip, right? The neurosynaptic chip. I mean, it's not a joke. Right? This is actually here. Cognitive computing and the shipping business. Here's a short clip that you should see. Cognitive computing enables people to create a profoundly new kind of value, finding answers and insights locked away in volumes of data. Whether we consider a doctor diagnosing a patient, a wealth manager advising a client on their retirement portfolio, or even a chef creating a new recipe, they need new approaches to put into context the volume of information they deal with on a daily basis in order to derive value from it. This process serves to enhance human expertise. Watson and its cognitive capabilities mirror some of the key cognitive elements of... I'll spare you the commercial here, but you should talk to those guys in IBM and Cisco and all the other ones that do this, right? Cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, that is a major thing coming towards us in terms of efficiency, optimization, making things work. Will most of your future employees look like this? I hope not. Right? But of course, some of them can look like this. I mean, for somebody that's just putting in data, you, you can probably have software do that, right? I mean, what we're seeing here is a trend towards predictive analytics, anticipatory services, prediction model, predictive analytics. I mean, most of you are already into this, but basically what we see here, this is a company that the CEO of, of uh, Facebook founded called uh, Vicarious. Their headline is, we're building software that thinks and learns like a human. That would be useful, right, if used in the right context. 
So what we see here is basically the combination of ambient computing, which means computing everywhere, predictive analytics, and what I call superintelligence. You know, making the business truly smart. Again, like I said before, superintelligence does not mean that you have actually found a human relevance to it, right? There is a difference, which I'll show you in a second. But basically what we're seeing here is a combination of that I think is going to be extremely powerful in the very near future. I have two more points and then we'll wrap up. Um, one point is energy problem will be solved. Right? I mean, what we see now in terms of innovation is absolutely astounding. Whether you bank on solar or wind or alternative energies or, of course, gas and other things, I mean, the, the energy problem is just about being solved. We're moving to a place, for example, in solar, where there's abundant possibilities and very, very low prices. Basically, every wall can be a solar wall. And now we have batteries solved. So that whole thing is going to be a very big deal. In my view, sustainable is the new profitable. This is a very hard thing to understand because right now you get punished when you think about sustainability, right? Because it costs more. In 10 years, sustainable is the new definition of what a profitable company is. If you bank on this today, you'll get it back in 10 years. I can guarantee you that. It takes a bit of stamina to do that. I'll skip some of this. I, I just want to say one more thing about the... Uh, the human part, right? Once we've reached efficiency and everything is optimized and everything is working well, which is roughly in about five to ten years, then we say social and emotional intelligence people will be the key differentiators. We cannot drop the people out of the system, right? Because it's good to have this, but we also need this. Right? Who makes those decisions? What are the ethics? What are the values behind it? Keep in mind, business is 90% emotions and trust and values and relationships, right? The rest is technology. And maybe technology will eventually be 20%, right? But not 90%. So that's kind of a, a double thing that we have to watch out for. Uh, Kevin Kelly says, machines are for answers, humans are for questions. Right? Keep that in mind, don't drop the question <laughs> just because you have a machine. Right? Ultimately, that is our job in business, is to ask the right questions. Okay, I got to wrap up and, and come to the last part here. Uh, quick summary. We weren't downloaded, we were born. Very important. Great quote from Gary Hamill. You have to look at what might be in order to survive the future. It's very important. Three to five percent of your time should be spent at looking what might be, not what already is. This is very difficult because we're all very busy, right, clearly. But this is a survival skill. Five key uh, takeaway points. Change is increasingly, gradually, then suddenly. Don't sit back and wait for change to happen because by the time it happens, it's exponentially faster than you. Right? Wait and see means wait and die. Right? It's a very un-German thing to say, I suppose. But <laughs> Also, expect exponential, combinatorial, and interdependent. You're not going to be successful by being independent. And this I say with my Swiss passport. There is no such thing except for Apple and very few other companies. Interdependence is the future. Think hyper-collaboration, think ecosystems. Machines are for answers, humans for questions. And the last point, examine the areas when you go home tonight where you are digitally contestable. Look at your business and say, how could somebody come in with a fancy piece of software, really powerful technology, and disrupt what I'm doing? Because that will happen in the next few years, right? whether you run ports or ships or maritime or pretty much anything else. So I want to thank you very much for listening. I'll leave you with this quote from Alan Kay. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Thanks very much for listening.